this morning. Welcome to our visitors. Just uh, like to extend the Especially me, going against the stream. I'm going to embarrass Neil here. Because <laughs> I could summarise Neil on a couple of words, and that might be just a <laughs> going against the stream. This guy is radical, man. He is. Hey, man. Hey, man. <laughs> There's a couple of late me's from the guys who know him. Anyway, balancing our lives and values. Balance, what is it? What's balance? A mixture of right and wrong, a mixture of good and evil, a mixture of your personal life as against your professional life. Can you define where one stops and the other starts? The other question I have for you is, are you in control of that life or is that life in control of you? Okay, that's something that you really need to have a think about. But there's, sorry, I'm not having a very good run here. All these things are things that only you as an individual can weigh up and decide what side of the scales you've come on. What side of, do you need to get things back into an even balance? Are things in a good balance? Can you make changes in your life to affect that balance? service this morning, you will have an opportunity if you wish to seek out myself and some of the other leaders around here and if you want to know a little bit more about how to make those changes to affect that balance in your life then I would encourage you to, to seek us out. Right now we have the congregational song so if you'd like to stand as the and her team comes on stage and we'll, we'll sing some songs.
and he put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, because we need scent. So the man went, and he washed, and he came home to see him. Later, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied. And I was washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, He is a prophet. The Jew still did not believe that he was, had been blind and that he had received a sight again until they had sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? they asked. Is this the one who was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. Don't read from John 9. Is it okay? Is it acceptable? Is it not okay? 
Should we accept this? What about a TV advert for a Toyota car that uses a certain word? I'm not going to use it. Is it okay? Is it acceptable? Now, I'm not going to try and debate the rights and wrongs of those stories. I'm sure I'm getting into big trouble. But they are both illustrations, ladies and gentlemen, of stories of incidents that are causing concern for our society because they are talking about an erosion of values. Our society is debating that. We are debating what is right and what is wrong in the values of our society. And we face it daily in our personal lives. When at work, we see, or maybe we're even involved in, the taking of work belongings, pens. Phew, I haven't got any in my pockets. No pens. Yeah, no, that's not mine, don't worry. And so on. That raises the question of what is right and wrong. When at school, if you're a student and your classmate abuses your teacher, don't let it happen. <laughs> I waited for that other few ladies and gentlemen. I'm a teacher, so I'm enjoying that one. But I can turn that around, unfortunately. I've been teaching a few years now, and I have unfortunately seen uh, the reverse when teachers take it upon themselves to become quite abusive of students uh, verbally and emotionally, and it's, it's not good. We see it daily in, our, in the world around us, this whole debate about rights and wrongs, values, graffiti, what we see on TV, violence, is it okay? Some say it is, some say it isn't. Every day we are faced with situations that challenge us to wonder whether the values we live by are being eroded. Now I want to go back to that TV program. You be the judge. Why does it work? Well, it doesn't anymore, I believe. I believe it's been pulled off. But anyway, why, <laughs> why did the producers put that program on the air? Because they knew it was going to cause debate. They knew it was going to cause consent. Why did they do that? Do that? Well, for those very reasons. They knew it would be controversial. They knew it would create debate, and that's exactly what they want. It's good for ratings. <coughs> but another question. Why? Why does it cause debate? We're all New Zealanders. We all live in New Zealand. Shouldn't we all have the same point of view, really? Well, we know we don't. We know there, and they know, there are people with very different points of view. And that's why the program works. It creates debate. They know that people judge whether something is right or wrong in very different ways. How can we be different about what's right and what's wrong? We're all New Zealanders. Well, to have formed in our minds some view on whether something is right or wrong, we must, in our mind, measure an issue against something. We have in our minds some measuring stick or way of measuring that says, no, that's not right, that's wrong. Say this book, just by chance I picked up this book from home, it's Neighbourhood Crime Prevention Handbook. Say this book shows us a list of all the things that we say are acceptable in New Zealand. It's got a list of things, yep, that's okay, well, oh, no, that's no good. Okay, so if we look in here, we'll find a section on door hinges. <laughs> I don't know what that's going to say about that, but we'll say somewhere in here, okay, murder, it's wrong. It's not acceptable. Now, I'm pretty sure most of us could live by that. But then we get into situations where we are dealing with other countries. We might deal with countries in terms of our trade or dif just even differences between those countries. And so our law, represented by this book, doesn't work anymore. Because we start hitting uh, different rules and different ways of doing things. So we need a bigger book. Okay, this book might do it. Alright, all the rules about trade, all the rules about practices, yeah, somewhere in here we'll find it. We'll be okay. But then, just occasionally something comes along that is very, very rare. And we have that at the moment. A situation in Kosovo. A war. Well, it's not in either of those two books. And the Western world is saying that it's wrong 
So we need a bigger book. So I can find at home, so let's have to do. Okay, we find a bigger book. Yep, this will do. This will tell us everything that's right and wrong. This is all about our values. We can live by this. That's good. Trouble is, there are other people on the other side who say, no, that book's wrong because we don't agree. There are things about that situation that are wrong. Wrong book. Different book. <coughs> Shouldn't we all use the same book? Shouldn't we all have a clear idea of what is right and what is wrong? How can there be all these different books? Well, some people would argue that when the war is ended over there, we might have some common understanding of what represents uh, agreement and we'll have one book. I don't know that we will, but we'll see. That's uh, kind of like a big picture of, uh, of a conflict in our values and our morals on a bigger scale. But it can happen in our personal lives as well. And we had that demonstrated here in our play. The two characters, one turned to the other and said, whatever happened to us? Where did our values go? Well, the other says, oh, I don't know, I, just, I guess we just grew up. And then the uh, first one turns again and says, yeah, we just grew into new ones. We just, just grew into new values. Now that, that interchange suggests that values can change. The values are relative to how mature or how old you are. Some people suggest that our values can actually depend on the situation or circumstances that we're in. <coughs> situation ethics. At work, it's okay to acquire a master trade pencil if you work for master trade, but uh, don't steal the boss's company car. It doesn't quite fit in there. <laughs> some things are okay, some aren't. When, if you're at work and you work with Bill, there's no Bills here, right? But if you work with Bill, I don't. I picked a name, I don't know anybody with a Bill. So anyway, if you're at work and Bill has got a problem with you because he knows every second lunchtime you just take that extra 10 minutes to enjoy your lunch. And Bill doesn't like that. Bill thinks that's uh, unethical. But what's his problem? Or maybe he just uses a different book. All these books, which book is right? What I've illustrated here is a kind of relativism in how we measure what's right and wrong. We have to have something to measure right and wrong against. The trouble today is that there are so many different things used to measure with. It all depends on who is measuring, as to what they use, and how they arrive at what is right and what is wrong. Sometimes we're also confused, we don't know what is right and wrong ourselves. Now you might be saying, well, I can live with that, we can live with that. It's been going on for a while anyway, and life isn't too bad. We live today in a world where everything, thank you, everything is changing. It's not a problem even if our morals and our values change. Forget it, we can cope with that. Well, I would suggest it is a problem. I would suggest it's a problem on two levels. And I would suggest that it's a problem in, or for the health of us individually on one level and us as a society on the second level. I just want to tell two stories to illustrate that. The first story to illustrate what it can do to us individually. And both stories are true stories. The first story is about a, um, a diplomat. It's uh, a diplomat, an American diplomat. And his job was to represent his country uh, in a European country, to represent America in a European country. And he started suffering severe health problems. He started suffering stress. He started resenting his work. He started not being able to do his work. So he went to his doctor. And his doctor talked with him for a while. And after a while, they realized that his problem was that he didn't agree with America, his government's foreign policy. 
he couldn't actually represent America in most countries because he didn't agree. And that stress was causing him to feel ill. That compromise, if you like. The fact that he was compromising his own values and almost hiding those values and representing American values, ones he didn't agree with. Well, his doctor said, basically said, get over it. He said, go back to work, accept the American policy, and you'll be okay. Well, the guy tried that. He tried that for uh, another five years, I think it was. And uh, instead of getting better, he got significantly worse. So he went to another doctor. Different doctor this time. He didn't trust the first one. Gave the same symptoms, describes his situation. And that second doctor said a very obvious thing. He said, it's not... It's not your problem, it's the problem is you're compromising your values. You have your set of values. The fact that you are not living by those set of values is causing you personal health stress, personal health issues. Simple. Change your job. And he did. Probably could have changed his government as well, but anyway, he changed his job <laughs> and his health improved dramatically to the point where within a couple of months even he was uh, living a good, healthy life again. So, on an individual level, compromising, living with uh, a lack of clarity about values, about what you believe in, can cause health problems. On an individual level, that is. Now, I want to tell you a story that uh, talks about how that uh, decay can cause a great problem for a society. And it's a story based around this cup. Believe it or not, that's a cup. It's a Jewish ceremonial cup for drinking. And it came into my family uh, 55 years ago. And it came into my family through my father. My father was uh, born in Holland, in the Netherlands. And he grew up during the war. And uh, in 1944, it became clear to the Germans that they were losing the war. And uh, immediately, as a consequence of that, they uh, upped the tempo. I better not move into that space. Up the tempo on the extermination of Jewish people. Uh, ethnic cleansing, we call it today. The ethnic cleansing of Jewish people. And uh, the Germans began rounding up the Jewish people uh, quicker, basically, to get them out of Holland and into uh, German for extermination. Now, the normal practice for the German army was actually that the SS had the job of collecting up Jewish people. Because of the haste and the extra pressure that was being put on to round up the Jewish people, uh, the SS couldn't cope with the extra work, if you like, and uh, they called in the regular German army to do it, regular German soldiers. Now, the, the SS had that mind frame. They were committed to the extermination. But that was not necessarily one that was shared by all Germans. And even in the German regular army, there was uh, not agreement with that, if you like. The family that lived next door to my father was a Jewish family. Uh, one morning, the Germans arrived for that family. And as was usual in that situation because uh, even Germans recognised the stress that a family was placed on under. Neighbours were allowed to come in and help a Jewish family prepare to be moved. Now it was usual that a, each person in the family was allowed to take a small bag of belongings. So that's how my father actually got to be next door at his neighbour's house. And he was helping the family select belongings to go into the uh, bags to be taken away. And during that, the Jewish father of that family slipped this to my father as a remembrance of his family. The one most powerful part of that story for me, though, is that uh, my father then tells me occasionally, and it is when he was in the kitchen watching... Uh, the German soldiers rounding up the family, and in particular one German soldier was sitting at a chair at the table. 
and he had one of the Jewish children on his leg. Uh, I think she was seven years old, and her name, I think, was Rebecca. And my father knew that family well, and he knew Rebecca well. And he remembers that situation because all he, the power of that situation was a German soldier. And instead of being a staunch person who was committed to extermination, this German soldier had tears rolling down his eyes, around, down his face. He was a man who could not change a situation he did not agree with. He was holding a seven-year-old child, he was probably a father himself, and that's why he could identify with that situation. And he was a victim as much as the Jewish family was. The Jewish family, none of them survived, unfortunately. We have that as a remembrance in our family. One of my father's brothers has a, a candle as well, a candle holder, I should say. And that's all that really remains of that family, as was practice in those days. Um, occupying armies used to take the belongings of the family as well, so they divided up, if you like. Now, that Jewish family were victims. They were victims of what can only be described as a polluted stream that captured thinking in the world or parts of the world during that war. That allowed people to erase other people. But that German soldier was also a victim now. He was in a situation where he was uh, powerless to act against something he did not agree with. And it's an example where a society can become so utterly gutted of moral values that things that we accept now as totally unacceptable were acceptable and could not be acted against. So, on two levels, an erosion of values can hurt us. On a personal level, in our own physical and emotional well-being. And on a societal level, in our society decays so far that we allow things that we know are wrong to occur. At what point do we realise that things have gone bad and wrong if we don't have something to measure against? When do we stop and say, how can we see our way through this situation? Our problems today lie in the fact that we no longer know how to measure and against what to measure. Should we use this book? Should we use that book? That book? Which book? Well, there is one book that can replace all of this, and it is called the Bible. The Bible is the account of God and of Jesus, who claims to be the Son of God. But we've got other belief systems with other books. Why is the Bible different? Why should we use God and His Word as a thing, as a measure, to measure our values against? As the only measure to measure our values against? Well, the difference between this book and other books actually lies and what church has celebrated last Sunday, last weekend. Last week, last weekend, the Christian world celebrated the resurrection. On Good Friday, Christ was placed on a crucifix with two men on either side of him. Now, a lot of people were crucified in that time. What makes Jesus so different? Well, what makes Jesus so different is what we celebrate on the Sunday, which is that Jesus was resurrected. He rose out of the tomb. He won a victory over death. He, in doing that, proved who he claimed to be, the Son of God. If he had, done, if he had not done that, then the Bible would just be a good book with some good stories in it, with some nice people, and some not so nice people. And it would just be entertaining. But instead of that, this is a living book. And it's, account, it's an account of a God who is a living God. In any other belief system, Jesus was just a good man or a prophet. No other book focuses on that claim that Jesus rose from the dead and is the Son of God. 
and no other book of laws that we live by today has anything close to that sort of point of reference, if you like. Today, we're often left bewildered by the challenges to values. Sometimes we don't act because we are robbed of our power, just as that general soldier was. To act, we're robbed of our power to act, and we see ourselves as victims. What could we have done? <coughs> well, if we want to go against the stream, if you're uh, in the physical sense going to go against the stream, you need three things. You need a boat. You need a pedal. And you need some land. You need some land from which you can push your boat, your boat out from. Now, if you've got the boat and the land, that's fine. But if you haven't got the paddle, you're going to go with the stream. The stream will carry you down. You can't do a thing. If we want to go against the stream of moral decline in our society, we need a boat, a paddle, and some land. If we want to go against the moral decline in our society, we have to have a piece of land that we can stand on. We have to have a piece of land we know is fixed, will not move. And in that place, we can take everything to it and we can say, I'm going to measure the situation at this piece of land and say yes or no to it. For us, in terms of going against the stream in a, a moral situation, we have a, a, like a piece of land in our mind, we're going there and we're measuring against that. Now the boat is actually just a movable piece of land, really, at the end of the day. You need a boat, but a boat is actually something you're either going to stand in or you're going to sit in. So really, a boat is another piece of land, somewhere you can stand. But the paddle is critical. As I said before, if you're in a stream, you want to go against it, and you haven't got a paddle, you can forget about it. The paddle gives you strength to go against the stream. And the paddle for us, in terms of moral situations and values, is simply how strongly we believe in the place that we stand. If we believe strongly in the place that we stand, we can paddle against anything. If we believe that that place is the right place to be, we can go against anything. If you're unsure about that, if you're unsure in a situation, then you're going to get swept up by the strength and taken away. Maybe today you've heard enough to say that I want to stand on that land that is God's land. Maybe you're saying, yes, I am tired of being confused, or even like a victim. I'm tired of all the shifting values. I want one place to stand. I want my piece of land to be solid. Not a bit of sand that can get washed down with the stream. I want my piece of land to be solid. Well, if you are feeling that way, then I invite you to join me in praying. I'm going to lead us in a short prayer now. And if you agree, at the end, I'd like you to say Amen. And a cue for you that we're about to uh, pray, or when I'm about to finish the prayer, will be I will say, and all the people said. And you can say Amen at that stage. Now, please, if you wish to close your eyes, Feel free, but I don't want to close your eyes. Fine, I'm going to close your eyes so you don't feel like I'm looking at you. <laughs> the reality is, I can't see anybody anyway because of the lights, but that's too bad. Okay. So we're going to pray. Let's pray. Lord, we live in times that confuse us. We often see things around us and wonder. How can that be allowed to happen? How should I view that? Well, Father, you have given us a place to view our world from. You have given us a place to stand. 
And that place is where Jesus was crucified. At that point in time, you gave us a new way to look at the world. Through eyes that love people and through eyes that know the power of God to right wrongs. And that is so well illustrated, Lord, by Jesus rising from the dead. Lord, we ask for those eyes. We ask for that power in our lives. We ask for your wisdom in standing for the values expressed in the life of Jesus. And we ask for your wisdom in standing for the values expressed in the Bible. And all the people said, Amen. Well, I think we should give uh, those people who've been involved a big hand, eh? Thank you. Thank you.